Ready? Let's go. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity. We pray for your blessings tonight as we continue with the book of Daniel in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Oh, by the way, I forgot one thing. Guess what's happening next Sunday night? James Cadiz is going to be here. And so he's just such a great friend, and I love how he communicates. So he's coming next week. So I'll be in Daniel tonight, James Cadiz, and then Daniel the week after that, picking up from where we left off. We're going to leave off with a cliffhanger tonight in Daniel. So I'm excited. So, uh, but we do need to get going. And we're looking at this, uh, Daniel chapter 2, interpreting the dream of the new world order. And let me tell you, the new world order, this global system is coming. Even Daniel has much to say about this. In fact, Daniel has more to say about what's coming than pretty much anywhere in the entire Bible apart from the book of Revelation. So Daniel's a powerful book. Daniel is a prophetic book. Daniel gives strength for living today. It prepares us for tomorrow. Uh, last time we saw uh, that Daniel was faithful in Babylon, he and his three friends, who we've come to know as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, they were tempted and they were tested, but they didn't cave into the temptations and they passed the test. Remember, they, they were not going to break the kosher laws. Uh, the kosher laws were there so they wouldn't eat the food of the king, they wouldn't drink the wine of the the king. God blessed them because of their faithfulness to God. We will be set apart to you. God blessed them with knowledge and skill in all wisdom. And Daniel was given an extra bonus. In Daniel chapter 1, verse 17, Daniel was given this gift from the Lord to be able to, tells us here, as for the four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. And tonight, we start to see how the understanding and the visions of the dream starts to be the payoff that God has blessed him with. Not only can he understand the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, he's going to be able to interpret the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. Now this is a big deal because the dream of Nebuchadnezzar launches from the time of the Babylonian kingdom all the way to the coming New World Order, the revived Roman Empire, and the day when the Lord Jesus Christ returns which i don't think is that far off uh, so i look at this and i think okay daniel interpreted the dream of nebuchadnezzar so we can understand because we have the written word here to know what the dream was know what the interpretation was but we also have the entire written prophetic word to help us make sense of the things that are going on today so we can rightly understand that jesus is coming soon based on not dreams, but based on signs that we see. So we think of some of the things in the news uh, this week. This was yesterday, absolute tragedy. Uh, death toll in Odessa, Texas, shooting rises to seven. A 17-month-old child is among those that are injured. You look at this and you think there's a recent shooting in Texas, I think, at a Walmart, and, and we're hearing these things that are happening Man, they're happening everywhere. As it was in the days of Noah, times of violence, it is happening. Here's what I want you to remember. Every one of these we see, there are people that are devastated. Um, death is a horrible thing. And you'll look at this, and I can't wait until Jesus comes and he fixes all of this. There's broken families, there's hurting families, there's devastated families. But Jesus is coming. One day we're going to be in heaven with him where there's no more tear, no more suffering, no more... Uh, no more violence, the, no more death, none of that stuff. The former things have passed away. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, and pray for these families. Every story, there's so much tragedy in this world. Uh, then we, we, we shift from the United States over to China. Uh, China's world domination gambit. Um, it, this is an interesting article. I read the whole thing. I'm not going to get into it. But Xi Ping, I think that's his name, the leader of China, president, uh, did I say that correctly, Gary? Something like that. You spell it X-I, but I think it's G is how you pronounce it. Did I pronounce that correctly? No? Am I close? Okay, good. Thank you. Um, so, listen, world leaders are megalomaniacs. They've got massive big egos. If you're the president of China or Russia or America or whatever, you look at this and you go, you've, you've got this bent. You, you have to, to just run 
in a democratic society to run for a position like that. Whether you're Democrat or Republican, in other countries to become king or a dictator, you've got to have this kind of bent. So why would you be a Putin, for example, and not want to be, uh, you, you want to dominate everything because if you're not the dominator, you're going to be dominated. China's that way too, right? Uh, America's that way. It, 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 it is the way it is. It's always been that way. You're never going to be able to get away from it. And China has the muscle. And uh, so we're watching what they're going to do, what their attempts are to do to, to control the world. It's not going to work out that way. So I watch China and I see what's going on. It, it helps me remember how close it must be to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the New World Order is not China at the top. The New World Order is this revived Roman Empire. And the way things are going with China, or we're watching this, this whole makeup happen. They've got the population, they have the brains, and they have the want to do this, but it's not going to turn out that way. This revived Roman Empire is going to come out of Rome. So this just reminds me, with the ability China has, Jesus must be coming soon because China will not be the one that rules the world. Then we have this, Hong Kong police fire live rounds to quell protesters as chaos rules the streets. Live rounds. Those aren't rubber bullets. Uh, that's, not, that's not gas canisters. Those are real bullets. To, look, we gotta, um, we got to deal with this. Uh, you know, they're dealing with the people. So Hong Kong saying, wait. In fact, in Hong Kong, they are saying, uh, we love Trump. Isn't that interesting? Right. I mean, they are praising Trump. In fact, a lot of countries are right now. They're saying, we want, uh, we want Trump. And in America, we have this media in Hollywood that are exactly the opposite because in, in these other countries, they know what it's like to have a dictator. They know what it's like to have socialism. In America, we have people running for president. It seems almost the whole particular side, you can figure it out. They're running on a socialist agenda. And all these, look at Venezuela, you start looking, socialism has never worked, it never will work. And you look and you go, man, there's, there's something messed up. But in the last days, God tells us that he will send strong delusion among the people that they will believe the lie. Ultimately, they're going to believe the lie that the Antichrist is king. A uh, U.S. slaps new tariffs on China. One minute later, China retaliates. So we're watching this between the United States and China, uh, between uh, Trump and Xi Jinping. They're going back and forth, this, this, this arm wrestling thing. And the masses in both countries are stuck in this thing. And it's, it's uh, interesting. Uh, this has to do with the economy. Um, I don't know when the economy is going to tank, but I know for a fact it's going to tank during the tribulation period. And, uh, but I don't, know, I don't know what that date is. If I knew that date, um, I'd be God. Yeah. But I'm not. And Jesus said, no, no man knows the day or the hour of his return. And all of that would tie into what's coming with the great tribulation period. Uh, then we have the hurricane that's, that's coming. Uh, we don't get hurricanes here in California. Um, we get earthquakes, but not very often. You know, they, they, They're getting earthquakes in Oklahoma now. North Dakota, South Dakota. Uh, but this hurricane, Dory, Dorian Fury, aiming toward Grand Bahama, max sustained winds, 185 miles per hour uh, movement west at 5 miles per hour. It's a Category 5, and there's winds now over 200 miles an hour in this hurricane. That is just unbelievable. So th it will bring death and destruction again. This is not pleasant. This is a reminder we need to be praying for people, praying for families, and, uh, and, and God's grace and God's mercy. Um, it's also a reminder of the sea and the waves roaring, too. American Airlines launches facial recognition to board passengers at DFW Airport. Anybody hear about this? Okay. American Airlines has begun using facial recognition technology to board some passengers at DFW. The facial scans replace the use of boarding passes at the gates. American Airlines calls the facial recognition a more secure verification system. One, this is a quote. Once you come to board, it matches your face with your passport photo, and if it matches, it allows you to board that aircraft. For now... The facial recognition is only being used on international flights out of Terminal D, but it's expected to expand. I fly, I've flown out of Terminal D many times. I'll let you know how it goes when they take my picture. Um, 
I, 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 I'm kind of excited about this. Is that weird? Because, I mean, I mean, I know all these databases, and, and I've watched Person of Interest many times on TV, and I'm thinking, this is going to be a trip. LAX has some of it, and they're, uh, they're, they're in the, the, it's the grooming stage, I guess you would call it, for, for what's coming. And I'm thinking, I don't plan on being here at the time of the Antichrist. So I look at this stuff. This is just a reminder uh, we're being tracked, and we're going to be more tracked. Uh, this says, American Airlines says it does not uh, store any of the photos. I say, <laughs> well, say whatever you want. <laughs> Maybe they don't, but I'll pretty much guarantee you Google does. Um, so you look at this. Daniel, has, he's able to take the dreams of Nebuchadnezzar. He has an understanding. We have the same dream. We know what it is. And then we're going to be given the understanding of what that dream is also. So we have the prophetic word, and then we match it to the prophetic signs, and we go, aha, we can see where all of this is going, as Daniel had an understanding. In fact, we alive today in 2019 have a better understanding of the prophetic events than Daniel did. Did you know that? You find that out when you get to Daniel chapter 12. Daniel goes, I don't know exactly what everything means. I see it. I can interpret it. I can tell you, but I'm not sure I connect with we because of all the, the word and the day that we live in, we can go, we can put all of these things together. The dreams, the interpretation, the signs, we can put it all together. And then, of course, we have Israel. Uh, the fighting dramatically escalates as both sides prepare for the final war between Israel and Iran. Listen, this is just a reminder that the war that the Bible speaks of, Ezekiel 38, 39, is going to happen. I do not know when, but I know... Israel prevails because God comes to their rescue. Israel's not going to be destroyed. I know that for a fact. You know why? Do you know how I know that? Because I've read my Bible. And I know how this whole thing ends. And, uh, and it's, 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 uh, it's going to end good for Israel. And it's going to end good for anyone who knows the Lord Jesus Christ. And here in Daniel chapter 2, we read as we have this dream happening. Check this out, verse 1. Now, in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar, he's the king of Babylon, had dreams. And his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. In other words, he couldn't sleep. Uh, this is fascinating uh, to me. But to really understand what's going on here, just as you read verse 1, and then the rest of Daniel chapter 2, uh, it, it's very fascinating that his spirit so troubled him so that he couldn't even sleep. This is the king of Babylon. For all practical purposes, you think this is the king of the world. He has a dream that keeps him up at night? How could this possibly be? Merrill Unger puts it I into perspective. He writes this about Nebuchadnezzar to really help us understand. He's the kind of king he is or was, Nebuchadnezzar's brilliant city of Babylon included vast fortifications, famous streets like the processional, canals, temples, and palaces. The Ishtar Gate led through the double wall of fortifications and was adorned with rows of bulls and dragons in colored enameled brick. Nebuchadnezzar's throne room was likewise adorned with enameled brick. Not far distant were the hanging gardens which to the Greeks were one of the seven wonders of the world. How well the words of Daniel chapter 4 fit this ambitious builder. Is not this the great Babylon which I have built for the royal dwelling place by the might of my power and to the glory of my majesty? The great Babylon I have built. But God entered into his dream and is so rocked his world that he could not sleep. Didn't visit him by an angel. He just visited him in his head. And the king of Babylon had a visitation by the king of kings. And the king of Babylon said, uh, uh, this is not good. But I look at this and I think he's going to turn the direction of the king of Babylon within the next couple of chapters. And I think how encouraging this is, because the king of Babylon, most powerful man in the world, is so troubled by a dream that God gives him that he turns him. This is strengthening. 
Because if God can turn the king of Babylon to whichever direction he wants him, just by dropping a dream into his head, you got trouble? You can know that the king of kings can do whatever he wants to turn that troubled person in your life another direction. In fact, in, in uh, Proverbs chapter 21, Solomon wrote, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. Um, this is encouraging. Because you might have a boss that's coming down on you, and you're thinking this is just not good, or, or, uh, or, or, or whatever the situation may be. Um, you can trust in the Lord and say, Lord, this situation, this person, the IRS... The uh, CIA, the Department of Homeland Security, uh, the school district, the state of California, uh, whatever it is, right? Your neighbor, uh, whoever it is, you can say, Lord, you can turn the heart of the king. You can turn the heart of my neighbor. You can turn the heart of the president. You can turn the heart of, of the prince. You can turn the heart of the boss. You can turn the, the heart of the person who runs this media channel, whichever direction you want. Listen, when you pray according to this, knowing that God can turn the heart of a king wherever he wants, you can pray and say, okay, Lord, I pray and I need a favor from you. I, I do this. And I'm able to rest in the Lord. If God turns it to my favor, I can say, praise you, Lord. Uh, and, and I can worship him and thank you, Lord, for doing that because I know only you could have done that. Make sure if he does that, you do thank him and you do praise him. And then sometimes God won't necessarily turn it into my favor. That's okay, too. You want to know why? Because I know that God can. And if he wants to, he will do it. But if he doesn't, I can rest in that and say, okay, Lord, for whatever reason, you don't want this to go the way I want it to go. You have a grander purpose that I can't see, and therefore I can rest in that, and I can get my sleep, and I can praise the Lord. Because I know that God is on the throne he has the power. If he wants to, he will. If he doesn't want to, he won't. And I can say, okay, Lord, you take it from here. In the meantime, please give me peace and please give me strength. Amen? So verse 2, then the king, he gave the command. So he has this dream. It's troubled him. He can't sleep. Verse 2, he, he gave the command to call the magicians, the astrologers. Look at this list. The sorcerers, the Chaldeans, to tell the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king, and the king, Nebuchadnezzar, he said to them, he said to the astrologers, the magicians, the sorcerers, the Chaldeans, he said to them, I have had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. Let me stop here before we go further, just point this out. Uh, in verse 1, we are told this, he says, uh, I had, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. Verse 2, uh, the king tells the astrologers, magicians, sorcerers, Chaldeans, his dreams. In verse 3, he said, I had a dream. Is this a contradiction? No, it's not. Here's what, what it appears what was happening. He has this reoccurring dream. It happens, and it happens again, and it happens again. Hence, dreams, but it's the same dream, and it's troubling him, and he cannot sleep. Troubles him so much, he calls in, the wisest men that he has to tell him the dream. And then the interpretation of the dream. By the way, starting in chapter 2, verse 4, through chapter 7, verse 28, Daniel shifts. It's no longer, the original is, is no longer in Hebrew, it's in Aramaic. And uh, Daniel wasn't just writing for Jews to be able to understand, he was writing for the Babylonians to be able to understand what was going on. Isn't that interesting? Always an evangelist. Always looking to deliver the message of the Lord to whatever people he is with. He didn't get mad and say, I'm putting this in Hebrew so those Babylonians can't understand. He didn't do that. I'm writing this part in Aramaic. I want them to understand that there is a God in heaven who interprets dreams and saves souls. So this is pretty cool. So you ready? Okay, let's get, let's get going. Verse 4, we have that background. Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic, O oh, king, live forever. There you go. Let's butter up the king. Tell your servants the dream, and we, you, you got to love this, and we will give the interpretation. The king answered, Nebuchadnezzar's smart. He didn't get to be king of the world because he's stupid. 
The king answered, and he said to the Chaldeans, my decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me in its interpretation, you shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made an ash heap. And they knew he was telling the truth. He would do it. He was that kind of guy. However, if you tell the dream and its interpretations, you shall receive from me gifts, rewards, great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. They answered again and said, let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will give its interpretation. The king answered and said, I know for certain that you would gain time. Because you see that my decision is firm. You're trying to buy time. I know, what you're, I know what's going on here. Because you don't want to be cut in pieces. And you're not sure how to handle my request. That's what he's saying. If you do not make known the dream to me, there's only one decree for you. For you have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the time has changed. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can give me its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There's not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such things of any magician, astrologer, Chaldean. It is a difficult thing that the king requests that there is no, uh, no other who can tell it to the king except the gods, whose dwelling is not with flesh. Uh, verse 12, for this reason the king was angry and very furious and gave the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon, slice them into pieces. So the decree went out and they began killing the wise men and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill Daniel and his companions. Wow! He's a little bit of a hothead. Nevertheless, he's very troubled by the dream. It's a big deal. And if he didn't act like this, we wouldn't have the interpretation of the dream. Nebuchadnezzar is smart. He's put up with these guys for a long time. Everybody has dreams. It's like he employed them, just entertained them, all right? Just tell me, tell, tell me what the meaning of my dream is. So he would tell, okay, I had this dream last night. What do you guys say it is? Well, you're going to live forever, O oh king. Uh, you're going to be rich. All right, go. You know, it's like gives them a job. Now they're put to the test. Okay, if you're really the real deal, tell me what my dream was. Well, we can't do that. If you're real, if you can really do this, you'll tell me what my dream was. And if you can tell me my dream, I know I can believe your interpretation. Tell me what my dream was. You can see he knows how to handle the situation. This is smart. Note some things in the passage that we just read. Uh, it's very insightful. Uh, we have, uh, Nebuchadnezzar has gathered to himself the committee of the world's wisdom. Who is the com this committee of the world's wisdom? Well, uh, we have the magicians. They're the fortune tellers. Uh, they're an elite group. They told others that they knew things that no one else knew. We know things nobody else knows. Today we would call them politicians. But here, we, we call them magicians. <laughs> uh, they're astrologers. Uh, this is not talking about stargazers, despite the English translation of astrologers here in Daniel chapter 2. These are certain individuals of the religious system in Babylon that gave secret incantations and deep interpretations of mysteries that the average person could not know. Uh, it sounds like some false preachers. And uh, people who say, well, I have a word for you. God's given me insight. And they, and they say something. You go, oh, go, my. You don't believe that stuff. You know, and uh, so Nebuchadnezzar had these kind of people. Uh, so, so Nebuchadnezzar, he's fishing them out. He knew they were phonies. If you're real... That's what you'll do. Who else did he have there? He had sorcerers, thought to be witch doctors, uh, Chaldeans. Uh, in this context, these are the pagan priests who ran the religious system of Babylon. And then there are the soothsayers. So who are the soothsayers? They'd be what we would term today as the astrologers. Um, these are what we would call astrologers in our day. Here, soothsayer means one who slices up the heavens. This is interesting because Nebuchadnezzar says, I'm going to slice you into pieces. Uh, they were slicing up the heavens. So think of astrology. So we would go into the signs of 
the zodiac and we have all the different signs of the zodiac and if you look up in the sky uh, if you've ever been into astronomy at all which is not the same as astrology astrology is the spiritual side taking the stars astronomy is science that's all it is um, but you have in there you see in in the skies you have the different star formations you have scorpio sagittarius libra virgo Leo, Cancer, probably everybody in here knows what sign they are, right? Anybody in here know what sign you are? You guys are so bad. No, listen, listen, you, you, we all know how it works. Anybody in here over like 50 years old? Come on, no, raise your hand. You're afraid to raise your hand. So you guys remember this, especially if you're over 60. So you remember way back in the 60s, it was even popular in the 70s, at least I remember when you're trying to start up a conversation with someone of the opposite sex. Hey, what's your sign? Remember that? <laughs> right? So, I mean, everybody knew what their sign was. I remember Love American style and watching things like that. And, uh, what, you know, anyways, all, all the weird stuff. Why, why do I get into these things? So, Cliff. Hey, where am I? Astrology. Okay, so you look at this and... Uh, um, this didn't originate in Babylon with King Nebuchadnezzar. It originated in Babel, which is actually the area of Babylon. Babel, the Tower of Babel from the book of Genesis where Nimrod, remember him? The original New World Order, the original globalist, the original king of the world, that was Nimrod. Then God separated uh, Babel at that time and the people were spread out to the four corners of the earth. Ever since then, the people have been trying to get back together, being led by Satan himself to bring the world back together. Interesting, the, this astrological chart started all the way back in the Tower of Babel, carried through to the days of Babylon, and still you open up the newspaper today or Google it, you can find out. Hey, if, it, it's kind of like a fortune cookie, the way I look at those things, and you can say almost anything, and think, well, that is me. I, I am going to meet somebody in the next week. You're right. Wow, I met somebody last... Oh, wow. This says I might become rich someday. Wow, I might... Well, of course you might, and you might not. I mean, you start looking at these things, you yeah, whatever. Gleason Archer, though, says, here's what these men were faced with. Um, they were faced with being cut up into pieces if they couldn't answer the king. And as bad as it was, they still, as bad as the threat was, they still couldn't come up with an answer. They couldn't, they didn't bother trying to tell the king what his dream was. Maybe some of them tried, he said, ah, no good. But it tells us here that they started to put them to death, and then they started looking for Daniel and Daniel's friends. But you'll look at this, and you'll look at the stars, you look at the charts. People are fascinated by psychics and palm readers. Chuck Swindoll says, fortune tellers, mediums, astrologers and psychics may stir up a lot of fear and curiosity they may even try to distort or supplant god's word and may appear to have the power of god by their trickery but they cannot do what only god can do they cannot discern the depths of his counsel communicate his heart or reveal his plan as we look at this in the context of daniel chapter 2 it's very clear this dream we're going to see it it's about the last days. It's about what is still coming. And it takes us through world history. And as I already mentioned, it takes us into the revived Roman Empire. And we know from the book of Daniel, we deal with, uh, we deal with the great tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, the seven-year uh, peace covenant. Well, we know all of that. Uh, but the world doesn't want us to know the truth of these things. And it's really not so much the world. It's, uh, it's the one who is leading the world, the God of this world, the prince of the power of air, Satan, the, the devil himself. So out in this world, there's deception about what is coming. We think of movies like this, Armageddon, right? Um, and other things that are made, they're entertaining and fun to watch. I like watching things like this because I know what the Bible says and I know how far off base they are. But, but I found this interesting. Terry James wrote this. He said, uh, this is a quote from CNN. Forget the book of Revelation. We have all the facts about Armageddon. Right, now, this is a while back. He writes, the CNN anchorwoman's opening statement into the lead story some years ago 
was given by light-hearted inflection, although her words undoubtedly were intended to grab the attention of viewers in preparation for the ensuing story about Armageddon, the movie sensation of that hour, the tongue-in-cheek lead in nonetheless uh, appropriately reflected the worldview of biblical prophecy. Hollywood, the fast, the, uh, fa- uh, the, I can't even pronounce the word, opening implied, uh, knows better than the God of the Bible what the future holds for mankind. So that's the implication. Uh, Dr. David Jeremiah remarked at that time, Satan hates the book of Revelation because it foretells his doom. It should not surprise us that a worldwide news medium should broadcast with such a lack of understanding because Satan, who is the prince of this world, conducts an ongoing propaganda campaign that presents near truths designed to keep fallen mankind on the broad way that leads to destruction. So there's all this deception. So in Babylon, they've got the fortune tellers and the magicians and the astrologers and right on down the list. And then in our day, we, we still get into astrology and, and these types of things. But they're all deception to tell you, well, this is the way it's going to be, not the way the Bible. So Hollywood has their version. Well, this is how what Armageddon really is. It, you can't believe in the Bible. People even believe in fortune cookies. Look, I think for, uh, at one time I wanted to invent and market misfortune cookies where somebody would open it up and it would give some, something bad that's going to happen. On there. I thought, you know, then I get sued if it actually happens, so I decided not to do that. Um, but, but I kept this. I have this on my desk and I keep it there just as a reminder. Stay with the Word of God. It's this. This came out of a fortune cookie. I cannot help you, for I am just a cookie. I like that. It it, it tells us what we need to know, doesn't it? Stay with the Word. There is a God in heaven who reveals the truth. So, we have number one, the committee of the world's wisdom. That's what Nebuchadnezzar has surrounded himself with, and he knew uh, they weren't coming up with the right, the truth. Uh, then we have the person, that be Daniel, filled with God's wisdom. Uh, we're not going to read all the way through chapter 2 today, just so you know that. Um, but let's look at verse 14. Then with counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. And he answered and he said to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree from the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the decision known to Daniel. So Daniel went in and asked the king, to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation. And then Daniel went to his house and he made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, that'd be Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, um, his companions, that they might seek mercies from God of heaven concerning the secret so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men in Babylon. It's been said that the crisis makes the man, but I think it's better said that the crisis reveals the man. Uh, That is the case with Daniel. There's a crisis in the land of Babylon, and and Daniel is revealed as a man who trusts the Lord God of heaven. Uh, The way Daniel was is a great model for all men and all women. Uh, uh, Daniel pleases the Lord. We found that out uh, back in chapter 1, verses 8 through 21 he was dedicated to the lord he wouldn't compromise himself god blessed him with wisdom and knowledge and also blessed him with the understanding of dreams when you put god first the bible tells us as daniel did in proverbs chapter 16 when a man's ways please the lord the lord makes even his enemies to be at peace with him that's what daniel did let me please you Sometimes we get into conniving and manipulating so others will like us. God says, look, love me, put me first, I'll work out all these other details that you have. You got issues with other people? I'll work them out. And Daniel found favor with the king. He, uh, Daniel, he pleases the Lord. Daniel is patient with the Lord. In verses 14 and 15, the crisis is revealed. Uh, Daniel and his three friends, they're going to be sliced into pieces like everybody else. But Daniel doesn't panic. Or he doesn't even shift the attention over to his three friends. He just goes, he just talks to the, 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 the chief, Arioch, and he says, hey, um, what's going on? Uh, I think I might be able to help in this situation because I know who the Lord is. 
Uh, so we have he pleases the Lord, he's patient in the Lord, and then he prays to the Lord in verses 17 and 18. Daniel went to his house and he made the decision known to Hananiah, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that they might seek mercies concerning this from the Lord God of heaven. Let, let's get a few takeaways before we go on, okay? You ready? These are going to be kind of fast takeaways. Are you ready? You really ready? Okay. Number one, uh, the battle is won when we pray. Keep that in mind. Daniel realizes that. He goes back. He says, we got to go to God first. Let's go to the throne. Too, too often, God is the last person that we go to. The battle is won when we pray. We need to be on our knees. I praise God that this morning services here at 412 Church turned into a time of prayer and worship. Um, I think you know, we would do better in every area of life if we would pray first. Often what we do is we make a decision and then we pray, God bless my decision. Uh, it's better to pray first and say, God, do you want me to even make that decision? The battle is won when we pray. In fact, it's, it's yeah, let's move on. It's a privilege to have praying friends. Amen? Daniel has praying friends um, it's a privilege to have praying friends. When I had my kidney stone a few weeks ago, Clay from our church, I'm not good with visitors coming around, you know. I don't, you know, I'd like people want to come, ah, you're, no, I don't want to see anybody. But Clay, I've known Clay since I began here 15 years ago, and he's been such a great brother and such a great friend. And uh, he came over, I said, yeah, Clay can come over. He can stay for one minute. Uh, that's pretty much how I work. <laughs> he brought over oil, anointed me with oil, prayed, and he said, I pray that your kidney stone, uh, he just prayed to the Lord, turn it to dust. And everything pray, he prayed, I, I felt that God answered. And he did. I was almost out of my pain medication. I'm thinking, this is going to be miserable. He prayed that it would be gone before I'm out of pain medication. Everything he prayed for. And, and, and it just transpired like he prayed. It's good to have praying friends. Um, you want to know what else? Uh, it's a privilege to be a praying friend friend um the same clay who came and prayed for me i got to pray for him the other day as his dad had a stroke while he's driving through oklahoma city and we realized wait a minute we we have praying friends and then like daniel we can also be that praying friend um we're the solution to some people's prayers. They've been praying for something. God brings us along. I found this. Remember, whenever you're in a position to help someone, be glad and always do it because that's God's answering someone else's prayers through you. Uh, we pray for others. We help others. Somebody else is praying, and that God sends us along. We go, uh, and sometimes we complain. I don't want to help. And God says, well, they are praying for help, and I'm, now I'm sending you. Um, so something to keep in mind. The battle is won when we pray. It's a privilege to have praying friends. It's a privilege to be a praying friend. God works best in our impossible situations. When we understand that we're in a situation we have no answer, like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that's when we are most dependent on the Lord. You know that? And the more we could recognize the words of Jesus are true, where Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing, if we would recognize that in everything, we'd probably be praying a lot more. But when we realize it's an impossible situation, that's also when God gets the most glory because that's when we're most likely to glorify him and thank him. When God answers little prayers, often we just forget about it and we move on like, well, I guess I don't need you, Lord. I, I fixed it myself. You know, we, you're like, wait a minute. I, it, it, it's, this is kind of a trip with Christians. They're praying. They have a friend who has cancer, family member, something like that praying that, that, that they went to the doctor and the doctor says they got cancer this isn't good they got stage three and then they come and they pray with you and you pray for them that the cancer would be gone god would heal them they go back to the doctor the doctor says i don't know what happened no cancer's there they come back and say i guess we didn't need prayer the cancer's gone it's like wait a minute isn't that what we pray for and as christians we do these things it's like wait a minute god answered our prayers it would be good to remember that. Uh, last takeaway for now is God stabilizes us when we pray to him. Like Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, God moves the heart of the king wherever he wishes. When we have troubles, whether it's another person or just troubles, 
Listen, we pray to him, and even if it doesn't work out our way, it stabilizes us. It centers us. It centers us on the Lord above. Does it make sense? Amen. Continue reading. Verse 19. We don't have much more to go tonight. Verse 19. Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel's friends are praying. Uh, so Daniel blessed the God of heaven. By the way, Daniel just didn't have the gift of interpreting the dream. God told him. that, Or we saw that in chapter 1, verse 17. Daniel still sought the Lord. He didn't just say, well, I got this gift, so bring it on, Lord. He still goes with his three friends, and he goes, we got to cry out for the mercies of God. And so remember that. If you have a gift, you still have to pray. You still got to turn to the Lord. So Daniel does that. Daniel blessed the God of heaven. And he answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals the deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we asked of you, for you have made known to us the king's command. So notice what Daniel does. He pleases the Lord, he's patient in the Lord, he prays to the Lord, and here he praises the Lord. Look what he says here in the verses that we just read. God changes, God removes, God knows, God gives, God reveals, God makes known. Daniel praises God by exalting his name even before he meets King Nebuchadnezzar. He knows that without God there would be no interpretations, no wisdom, no audience with the king. In fact, he knows there would be no kings and no countries at all if God did not will it. And praise reminds us that without him we can do nothing. So Daniel gives God all the credit. Verse 24 says, therefore Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me before the king, and I will tell the king the interpretation. Then Arioch quickly brought Daniel before the king and said thus to him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah who will make known to the king the interpretation. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers, eh, they can't declare it to the king. Eh, they don't get it. They're like a fortune cookie. But there is a God in heaven. There it is. There is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter, did you see this? In the latter days. I believe we are living in those days. He's made known what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. And that's where we're stopping. We'll find out what these, what? That's, we have to stop. We're almost out of time. Oh, we are out of time. Well, let me finish up a little you want me to finish up this just explain that okay so before we conclude think of this uh, Lehman Strauss said on prayer in prayer meetings such as this history has been made uh, here this isn't just history this is the history of the world and according to verse 28 it's the history of the latter days. It included Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, and it takes us all the way up to the, the revived Roman Empire that is coming, the kingdom of the Antichrist, the kingdom of the false prophet, the, the uh, false peace covenant that is going to come to the nation of Israel. It includes all of these things. It takes us up to the days when the world's economy is on the brink of destruction. It takes us up to the time when there's signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and the sea and the waves are roaring, and there's earthquakes uh, that are in various places, and pestilence. It takes us right up into those days. That's the time of the dream, from Babylon all the way to the kingdom of the Antichrist. I believe it's the generation in which we live. Just a few more things to think about as we look at some of these things. So Daniel is interpreting a dream 
of Nebuchadnezzar, the Bible gives the signs. We already talked about that. So we can have an understanding of the days in which we live. Look at this. Uh, hallelujah, bless this room. Pastors bless abortion clinic. This is Catholic, Protestant, and rabbis. It, 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 it goes across them all. This is the reality of the world that we live in. Do you realize how bad of a world we live in? This is the spiritual world that we live in. That, my friends, is bad. It's bad when, those, when people do these things who don't do it in the name of the Lord. They're, they're, they, don't, they don't know better. They haven't heard better or whatever. These are church leaders. You think the church has problems? It's messed up. And then there's this. Beto campaign crowd booze man advocating God and prayer. This is, okay, now, understand, this is the direction of America with people who are running to be president of the United States. Listen to this. A man at a hall event in South Carolina for a 2020 Democratic hopeful, Beto O'Rourke, was booed for urging America to return to God and prayer in schools in response to an epidemic of mass shootings. And this is before the one from yesterday. Quote, I grew up with goals. This is what he said. I'm the son of immigrants. We played in school. The worst problem in school is chewing gum under desks, the man said when given the microphone at the, at the event. Members of the audience responded with boos. One jeered. It's 2019. Um, another shouted, nobody wants to hear you. Give the mic back. Uh, so this is where we live. So Daniel had the dream and the interpretation of the dreams. We have the Bible. We are are crazy if we're unwilling to look at the Bible and the days in which we live and pretend like, like, yeah, we've got a thousand more years. Listen, I look at this, and apart from God coming down from heaven and doing a worldwide awakening, we have, we are not far off from the time when the Lord Jesus Christ is coming. Uh, and then there's this, exclusive Bishop Schneider says Vatican is betraying Jesus. Well, what is this? This is, this is insightful. Um, the Vatican's decision to implement a document, listen to this, affirming that the diversity of religions, did you catch that? That's a quote. Diversity of religions. You can tell which direction this is going, right? Is willed by God. The diversity of religions is willed by God. Then why did Jesus come? Why did God have a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the first place? and then follow through to the Davidic covenant and the, and the Messiah coming. A diversity of religions as willed by God without correcting the statement is tantamount to promoting the neglect of the first commandment and the betrayal of the gospel, said Bishop Schneider. Um, some people that are in Protestant churches like this one and others that are watching um, have a hard time with this thinking that Anybody that's Catholic can get into heaven. Um, listen, I, I, I don't even want to get into that argument right now. But I look at this, and, and this bishop is saying Jesus first. The gospel of Christ first. There is no other way into getting into heaven. I have a book in my office. It's a very large book called The Keys to This Blood. And it's about the problems written, it was by a man named Father Malachi Martin, who I believe was a Jesuit priest. But what he wrote gave insight to the Vatican, and he said everything this bishop said. He said the Vatican is corrupt at its core. They've turned from the virgin birth of Jesus. They've turned from the true gospel. And within the court, now this is back, this is back a couple decades back when he wrote it. He since has died. He said, what's coming underneath is this absolutely corrupt form of religion. What's happening also is it's not just the Catholic Church. This is affecting the Protestant Church, and the whole thing is going this way. Um, this dream of, that Daniel interprets is a view of coming attractions. Uh, it takes us right up to uh, the time of the, uh, the New World Order. Um, Commenting on the new world. Can I give you one more thing? Actually, I'm going to give you two more things. But uh, Damon Duck, one of my favorite commentators, 
I was commenting on his prophecy page a couple days ago, and I'm going to quote him. He wrote, the Bible teaches that there will be a world government headed up by a man that we call uh, the Antichrist during the tribulation. He says this, a reader sent me part of a podcast with Rush Limbaugh talking about world government. This is just the other day. In essence, Duck writes, Limbaugh said world government is not a conspiracy theory. It is coming out of the EU, but it is active all over the world. Power mad, money crazy globalists are trying to eliminate nations and the borders of nations. The one obstacle in the world, he writes, uh, or, or Limbaugh said, is President Trump and the, <clears throat> and the United States. President Trump has, for now, <clears throat> busted their globalist dreams. Continuing to comment on the coming New World Order, uh, that, that Daniel, this dream, we're going to get into the dream next time. James Cadiz next week, the week after that, we're getting into this dream. It's going to be a lot of fun, at least fun for me, because that's like one of my favorite things to look at. Uh, Damon Duck continues and says, to have a shadow government instead of people deciding who is qualified to run for office, giving mega bucks to their person to, of choice, writing the laws, dictating what is right and wrong, trying to overthrow those that were elected, he writes in parentheses, Russian collusion, etc., is dangerous for any nation. <clears throat> we don't have time to get into all of it tonight. But I look at this, and I can tell, because of the Bible. Book of Daniel, Book of Revelation, other prophetic books, the direction all of this is going. God gave us his word, and we're crazy if we don't pay attention to it. The last thing is this. <clears throat> In Babylon of Nebuchadnezzar's day, you had the religious system and you had a political system. The political system of Babylon is gone. The political system of the last days is going to be this revived Roman Empire with the Antichrist at the top. But the religious system of Babylon is going to be here. How do we know that? Book of Revelation says this, Revelation chapter 17. The woman was arrayed, this is talking about the false religion of the last days um, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication and on her forehead a name was written mystery babylon the great the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth i saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of jesus and when i saw her I marveled with great amazement. Mystery Babylon, let's go all the way back to Daniel chapter 2. Mystery Babylon, the kingdom that Daniel was kidnapped to and taught in the ways with the soothsayers and the astrologers, the magicians and all of that. Mystery Babylon in its religious system influences all the nations of the world today. And whatever Babylon's religious system was, it's influencing pretty much all the religions of the world today. So I was able to show you a picture a minute ago of pastors praying for God to bless abortion, uh, an abortion clinic because of this. Does it make sense? Hence, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 teaches that in the last days, God will send a strong delusion upon the people that they will believe the lie, and also they will the people, First uh, Timothy chapter um, 4, I think it is, that in the last days perilous times will come, and people will think, they, they'll, they'll be religious, they'll have a form of godliness, but they're going to deny the power thereof. They're going to be very spiritual, blessing abortion clinics, but deny the truth of the power of the word of God. In this, this is where we'll wrap it up, Babylon's religious power entered the Roman Empire through the Etruscans with their secret mystery religion. One of the famous Etruscans was Julius Caesar, who took the title Pontific, Pontifex Maximus, a.k.a. Supreme Pontiff. And when Rome fell politically in 476 A.D., the bishop of Rome was Damascus, who then took the title Pontifex Maximus, and every pope since then has kept that title. The title came out of the mysterious Babylonian religion. So you look at this, you start to look at these things, you put them together and you go, well, this is interesting days that we live in. 
These are interesting days that we live in. But with that, what do we know? When we see these things begin to happen, look up, Jesus said, because our redemption draws near. And I can't wait. We're going to get more and more into this. But listen, we better be ready. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word.